and this is Eric Kocker. Uh, and it's really my great pl uh, pleasure to have invited him to come and speak. Um, so he's a professor at the at MIT's Media Lab, uh, where he runs the Scheller Teacher Education Program uh, and the Education Arcade, which simultaneously houses all of these programs, 20 postdoc researchers, graduate students, all working on cutting edge digital environments and resources for use in formal and informal educational spaces. So all You're of off camera. Are, You're am, off camera. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's good. I'll get started. <laughs> I can, can I, I'll just move my mouth yeah, as hey, if I'm hey, saying hey, these hey. things. <laughs> so all this work has been funded by notable organizations such as the National Science Foundation, the Department of Homeland Security, NIH, Hewlett, Gates, and many more. There's over 30, as I learned today, 30 grants that he's had in this very illustrious career. So he's called, authored three, uh, three books, over 100 articles, book chapters, and proceedings, consulted all over the world um, to help develop and investigate the use of computational tools in education. So I've known Eric for about 15 years, maybe a little bit longer. And throughout this time, what I've uh, really admired about him is his ability to see into the future and to anticipate and then capitalize on affordances of digital platforms for learning. He is a renowned expert in education games, mobile devices, simulations, and augmented reality technologies, among other things. Uh, and today, he'll be talking to us about his latest forays into the design and delivery of MOOCs. So please join me in welcoming Eric. Thanks, thanks for that introduction. Um, so, and thanks for having me here. Um, just to give you a little bit of a, a preview for, for what I'm going to do here, um, the title of my talk may or may not actually match what you saw on posters, and it, I probably would change it if I, if I could even today, because this is such a rapidly evolving field. And uh, there's lots of questions that are surrounding the use of MOOCs, the development of MOOCs. Um, I'm here to say I don't have the answers to any of those questions. Um, but what we do have is sort of insights from lots of different fields that we're using um, to help design our own MOOCs and hoping to use that uh, work in and of itself to help under, uh, advance our understanding of how people can um, and do learn in these environments. Um, so a quick overview of, of, uh, of my talk today. Um, I'm going to start by trying to get this to work. And then give up. <laughs> Use the space bar, maybe. Nope. Weird. Oh, nice. Let's try this again. There we go. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to start, start about sort of my perspective on uh, where learning has been and where where it, uh, it is today, um, and a little bit of where it could be tomorrow. Uh, try to build some of our own understanding from where we've been in, in, the, in the MOOCs, which has a relatively short history, and computer-supported collaborative learning, which has a much longer history. Uh, talk about the design that we've done in our own courses. Um, we're developing four courses that I'll talk about, um, and some of our goals for those courses. Um, a big uh, part of those courses and uh, part of my talk today will be about how we build community in MOOCs. So this inherits uh, some ideas from CSL. It isn't CSL, but it is uh, inherits some ideas from that. Specifically, we're looking at how we use community to generate peer feedback um, and how we use discussion forums and groups um, to help people work together and to generate ideas. Uh, and then I'm going to talk at the very end about how we sort of get engineers and educators to be able to maybe be a little bit more on the same page as we're thinking about development um, and research around these platforms. Uh, the platform, as we call it in, in our own, this collection of four courses, they're all around educational technology and games, and we call this collection EdTechX. Um, it's sort of a working title for now. Um, and that's my lame Minecraft font. Um, so, uh, so if you've ever been to any talk in the last five, ten years, uh, particularly from startups in the educational technology space, um, they often start off with a, a slide like this. This is how learning has been for a long time. Um, this is a picture from long ago. It's in black and white. You can tell it's from long ago. This particular one is from MIT um, in a lecture hall that we have. It's our, our biggest lecture hall on campus. Um, and they say, and today, learning looks pretty much the same. It's the same lecture hall. People are learning pretty much in the same way. Um, and then we often sort of say, well, OK, so how should, how should learning look? And oftentimes, the next slide, which people don't um, necessarily explicitly put in there, is they think about this as the next stage of learning. So we've moved from the lecture hall to the lecture hall to the lecture hall. Uh, and we, we, except now, it's more digital and even in more colors than it is before. 
Um, and really, sort of when we take MOOCs, what we're really doing is basically doing the same thing. We've sort of maybe moved a little bit beyond, like we're going to do this all in Second Life, or we're going to have people have avatars. Um, but really, when we're doing things in MOOCs, we're sort of having the same sort of lecture style that we've had for a really long time. Uh, and in fact, it's even getting worse, perhaps, because um, when we move into this style, we get rid of all the other people in the room, and now I'm the only person in the room. So I don't even have somebody to turn next to me, necessarily, uh, and talk to, whether it's productive or counterproductive conversation, it's still no one there to, to be able to help generate those ideas. Um, and that's really what we have here. We have the, the, the classroom of one um, where I'm learning from this lecture all by myself um, when I'm in most of these environments. So um, we can think about it this way. I think about educational technologies. So educational technologies sort of have um, some quantitative changes and some qualitative changes that they can, that they can induce. Quantitative changes are things like efficiency, scale, cost. Um, educational technologies have been good at sort of doing these sort of things for a while, and those are the things that often survive. On the other side, we have qualitative changes that can happen, things that change the pedagogy, the activity, um, the engagement of students. Um, for the most part, uh, these change who, where, and how many people participate in courses when we're thinking about this on the MOOC level. Um, but on this side, we can change who, which particular people, and how they learn. Um, and the particular people is actually a really important thing um, that a lot of the MOOCs have missed. Uh, so the current MOOCs, um, uh, the X MOOCs, as I'll talk about in a second, uh, uh, on Coursera uh, and, uh, and edX sort of exist sort of more on this end of things. They're using technologies to change the quantitative aspects of education. Um, but we really want to be able to think about how we can move that much more in this way and we can really change the qualitative aspects as well. These things are important. And, and, uh, and if we look at a lot of the literature that's happened, or a lot of the press, I should say, that's happened around these things, they have gotten education to more people who perhaps couldn't have afforded it before. So these things shouldn't be ignored, um, but we shouldn't look at these as the only part of the, the, the uh, educational technology advancements we're looking for. So getting onto that, so this is a map of, of all the people who have taken all the MIT X courses. Um, the, hot, the darker areas are places where there's been more people, um, and the lighter areas are where there's fewer people. Um, and we can see that if we look at just the registrants, there's almost a million registrants when this was taken uh, in February of this year. Uh, there's obviously a lot of them are in the United States, but we see things like in India and Brazil, there's a lot of people in parts of Europe, um, China. Um, we see that this is being uh, at least registered from people all over the world, 192 countries. Um, so that's a, that's a big number there. Um, but this is the number of certificates that were earned. Um, so we see here things like uh, we've now earned 27,000 certificates. So these are people who completed the courses and were, uh, did it well enough to earn a certificate. So this is a 6.4% certificate attainment. Um, so it's a, a really low level of people who actually go through and complete the courses. So if we're thinking about the change that this can have in the world, um, probably that change needs to be someone more than registering for the course. If you've used any of these, it simply means that like I've clicked, I want to take this course. Typically, if you want to see, hello. <laughs> Uh, typically, if you want to see anything about the course, even if you want to see the syllabus, you have to click that button that says register for the course. Um, so those numbers are, uh, are, are, are unrealistically large in terms of what we're seeing there. Um, but more, so we're only down to 6.4%. Um, so this is, a, this is a MITx registrants. Um, uh, of these, 64% have bachelor's degrees already. Um, so the, in terms of who we're reaching, not even just where we're reaching, but who we're reaching, we're reaching a population that's typically already well-educated. They're people that have already learned how to succeed in some sort of lecture course. They've gotten a bachelor's degree somewhere else. Many of those places have been in lectures like this one, um, where they've, people have already learned how to learn in those environments. Um, and you can see the distribution of that, um, where people have bachelor's degrees. Uh, that, that also varies uh, geographically, and there's interesting patterns there as well. Um, so that's, that's a number that really needs to change uh, if we really want to think about that impact that we have on a worldwide basis. So instead, we sort of th again, we want to think about qualitative changes. Um, so qualitative changes means it's thinking about other ways that we learn <coughs> and bring pedagogies that have been typically um, maybe more marginal, at least in post-secondary education, project-based learning, collaborative learning. How do we bring those pedagogies online and enable other people in other places to, to, to learn in that way when those people have not had a chance at all to perhaps learn in those ways, at least in, in formal education? Um, we also can think about ways, so that's bringing things from classroom instruction, but as we think about ways that people sort of interact and learn, maybe not in formal environments online, um, we can think about other kinds of methodologies and pedagogies that we can bring. These are, this is from uh, World of Warcraft, uh, a game where people are sort of working together to solve a particular problem at the same time. In this case, it happens to be killing something, but it still is working together to solve a problem. Um, and that's an environment that sort of gives people a, a, a problem that they feel invested in. It gives them the tools they need to solve that problem. It gives them perhaps a challenge 
that's not immediately solvable. And then they ultimately work together to try to solve those problems. And those are exactly the kind of environments we want to create online. And um, we see those also, so this, that was the actually playing of the game. Uh, for those of you who know the no World of Warcraft around the, the literature around this, um, you may have heard of this website called the Elitist Jerks. Um, this isn't uh, this isn't from academics. This is from uh, this is from other people who play World of Warcraft, uh, and uh, it's a site where people go on to discuss lots of different ideas about play within the game. Uh, and again, it's a place where people have a central activity that's playing the game, but then they use these kinds of forums to discuss issues, plan strategies. Uh, you'll see participation in this varies widely. There are lots of people who read and fewer that write a lot, a lot of like what we see in the rest of um, uh, uh, MOOC courses. So what we're trying to do in our, in our courses is, um, so this is the listing for edX courses. You'll see that there is no listing for education on edX. There is one on, on Coursera. But we're trying to get a little bit of education into edX. And we mean that sort of literally we're trying to get a line item in there, which we will have for our courses. But we're also trying to help some of our ideas that people have learned about the way people learn get into some of the courses in edX, which um, in a lot of cases is too rare. Um, so one of the places we draw from uh, to, to do this is from computer-supported collaborative learning. There's a rich history of computer-supported collaborative learning. I'm going to talk about how CSCL and different kinds of MOOCs contribute to our ideas. Um, so that many of you probably know Knowledge Forum and its predecessor. I found a little old Mac <laughs> picture there from, uh, from Cecil. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, this sort of learning, online learning environments typically supporting in-person uh, education. So this is online learning environments that people use to support in-classroom project-based learning. Uh, a rich history around this, rich literature around this, around the way that we design these environments, the way that people use these environments, the way people structure classrooms around these environments. Um, there's a good quote down here. It's about users, responsibility, users taking responsibility for their own learning, um, which is a really important thing, that they need to be able to be accountable for their own learning and help other people learn as well. Uh, so this goes back, this goes back, literature goes back at least 20 years. Um, CSCL locates learning and meaning negotiated carried out in the social world rather than in individuals' heads. This is really important to think about as we think about the way that typical MOOCs are designed where it's an individual that's learning in, a, in an environment by themselves. Maybe you go to the forums for some help or something like that, but it's typically thought of as an individual learning by themselves. But learning is social, and we really need to be able to design online learning environments that take into account that learning can and should be social. Um, so I have to find sort of four, whoops, did you get that? <laughs> I have to find four different aspects that I'll talk about for these different kinds of uh, MOOCs and CSCL. The locus of activity, the activity itself, um, the structure of the activity, and the goals. So for the locus of activity um, in CSCL, it's typically a centralized uh, space for collaboration, but it's around a face-to-face -face class. It's around a personal face-to-face uh, -face learning experience. The activity centers on uh, computer activities and knowledge building in a community um, and also collaborative projects. So even the things that you're doing are with other people as well as talking about those projects online. The structure is, is often by the teacher and that's been a, a challenge for CSLs thinking about how you train uh, teachers to be able to support computer supported collaborative learning in their classes. Um, but it does allow some flexibility for how students approach a particular design and for how teachers do for that matter. And the goals are to build knowledge as a community, sometimes with projects as a result. Um, so what, a CS, what CSCL is not? Um, it is simply not true that posting of content such as slides, text, or videos makes for compelling instruction. Such content may provide important resources for students just as textbooks always have, but they can only be effective within a larger motivational interactive context. Thank you. <laughs> um, and it's really important that we think about uh, with the way these MOOCs are used, and in fact a lot of the MOOCs today I think could be really beneficial tools. I, I don't want to sort of dis the way that we've thought about the current design of MOOCs. But the way that they fit into an overall learning environment really needs to be questioned. If we think about them more in a, in a hybrid environment where the MOOC sort of replaces the textbook, we can think about that as, as perhaps a really important potential tool in learning. If we think about them as an isolated learning environment all by themselves, then really they, they may not be sufficient in supporting that kind of learning. So we think about MOOCs past. Um, so they're really, when people think about MOOCs, this is not what they think about. But this is where the origin of MOOCs um, came from. They're called connectivist MOOCs. Some of you may know this history, but I'll sort of give a brief overview for those of you that, that don't. But the idea in these kinds of MOOCs was that it was not a centralized uh, delivery platform, but rather this is a map of all the collective platforms that were used. Everything from kind of casual social tools like Google Groups and Flickr um, to more sort of centralized sort of curriculum areas. 
But the idea is to not have a single person in control of a course, but the community takes control of the course, the community posts resources, uses resources, and, and ultimately the, the course kind of grows organically. This is the, the Siemens and Downs course from 2008. is probably the most famous initial example of that. Um, and they've continued to do work in this space as well. Um, again, sort of looking at these same aspects here, and this is sort of a map of what goes on in, the, in one of those courses. They're using blogs, they're using wikis, they're using lots of different social tools to connect their learning environment and build it and let it grow organically. So it's very much decentralized resources from around the web. Um, you may have a, a, a single resource that sort of kicks this off or gives the idea or the initial structure, but from there the community leads the whole course itself. Um, it's a lot about networking between individuals um, and community development. So the development of that community itself uh, is, kind of, is kind of one of the goals. Um, it's structured, very much individualized. People can participate in whatever aspects they like, wherever they want, however they want. Uh, and the goals are really to complete a project or simply to build knowledge or even just build your network. Um, that aspect of the course building itself is one of the goals. Um, so these are the MOOCs we're typically familiar with. These have a much shorter history. These only go back a few years. Uh, these are known as the X MOOCs. Um, and uh, in this case here we have, uh, I'm assuming people are familiar with the nature of these, but it's a very much centralized activity. You're delivered through a single website typically. All of your curriculum, all the videos, everything comes through one place. Uh, the activity is very much um, uh, about learning content delivered through the platform. It's very much of a transmission model. Uh, there's weekly syllabi um, with problem sets, often auto-graded things, um, some essays and quizzes. Uh, as much as possible, people try to reach scale, and for the most part, they've done this in, in a pretty automated way. And the goals are to pass a course typically determined by a grade that you might get in that course. Um, I will say that those goals are a little bit, uh, a little bit hazy, and the, the MOOC platforms themselves are starting to realize some of this. Um, I can't remember if this is from edX or Coursera. But now when you sign up, um, it asks you to tell you your goals. I'm strongly committed to mastering the course materials, learning the course materials mainly by watching the lectures, or none of the above, I'm just checking it out. Um, so there's an acknowledgement that when we see these registration numbers and we see people registering for courses, that those numbers aren't an accurate reflection of who's in the course and what they're doing. And they're trying to get some measures of why people are taking these courses other than, than they actually really want to take it. Um, some people really just want to sort of have some casual understanding of something, they're not really there to take a course, they might watch a few of the vi videos, see a syllabus, and sort of register it in the back of their minds for later retrieval. Um, so when we look at learning online, we think about things like CSCL, we think about uh, and MOOCs. Um, these have with them history, pedagogy, and research. Um, these are really important aspects that are often ignored as we're developing new learning environments online. Um, and we want to see how some more of that can actually get into the massive online co on courses that we have. Um, because these do have scale, they do have technology, and they do have resources behind them right now. And that allows us to both think about them as research tools, which we can use potentially to learn more about the way people learn, um, and they also allow us to be able to reach more people, uh, and perhaps, perhaps even in more effective ways. Um, so we want to see some of that going back here to the way we see computer-supported collaborative learning uh, informing this, but we also want to see some of these technologies be able to support CSCL at larger scales. So the way we see our course is um, sort of as uh, uh, taking a little bit of bits and pieces from each of these different environments. So from computer supportive collaborative learning, we see groups as an important aspect for our courses. We see projects uh, from, those, from those environments, and we see the social aspects as important. From connectivist MOOCs, we see about the community um, as an important goal, and networking in and of itself is an important goal for people taking our courses, or so as we design them. And from X MOOCs, we do see, think the structure, we have weekly syllabi, um, the sequence, uh, that they, things go in order, um, and some of the organization that we have from those environments are what we all use to sort of be able to um, create this environment we, we call EdTechX. Um, in turn, um, we want to see what comes out of EdTechX, uh, and, uh, and we're still early on in the development, as I'll talk about in a few minutes. The first courses will only come online this fall. Uh, but we want to see, in terms of metrics, so we're looking for a more diverse audience. So we're trying to attract people, and, uh, if there's, and I'll talk about this at the very end, but if you look at, I talked about bachelor's degrees, but there's also a lot of gender skew in, in terms of who people are taking these courses, uh, education, age, there's a lot of skew in terms of who's taking these courses, and we want to be able to attract more diverse audience to our course. We want to see people have greater participation. Um, you saw some of those numbers, about 6% of the people who register actually complete them. Um, I'll talk about some numbers later in terms of forums. There's typically very low numbers of people who actually participate in an active way in these courses. 
Uh, we want to see projects. All of our courses are project-based, and so we're going to be doing some evaluation um, of some of the projects, and we want to see quality work coming out. Um, and we'll be doing some qualitative research on the feedback from our technologies and our pedagogies ourselves, um, pulling people from the courses um, that we'll be able to interview. Um, the question is how we actually do want to need those things. Uh, so this is, this is the way we see our course here. So this is, a, I'll talk about this a little bit later. This is our, our forums. Um, but our locus of our activity is centralized through a single site. So we do have a site that people will come to. It's, it's, it will be on edX. Um, but it's about learning from a community um, and solely online. So it's different from CSCL in that you're, there is no face-to-face -face interaction. Um, but there is very much a community aspect which comes from uh, a lot of these more social environments. The activity will involve community formation and networking as well as uh, focused around particular content. Um, the structure is around weekly syllabi, so much like the existing um, MOOC courses on edX and Coursera, um, but there's projects for each of the courses. Uh, and you'll participate and create a project. Uh, there'll be no grades associated with the course. Uh, we, as I said, we don't have the answers to, to the questions around MOOCs, and in fact, there's a, a lot of other people exploring other similar ideas. I just kind of wanted to put a little bit of, um, uh, talk about some of our nearest neighbors in this space, literally and figuratively. So this is, uh, this is Learning Creative Learning that uh, Mitch Resnick and Natalie Rusk are running, um, and Philip Schmidt at MIT. They are not using um, uh, the edX platform for delivering this. They're using P2PU, um, which Philip helped create. Uh, peer to Peer University, which is a, a website for creating sort of small courses which you can deliver to friends and whoever wants to take those courses. Uh, everyone has expertise, connecting and sharing and feedback. These are their mottos for their, for their site here. Uh, and it's a course that's going on right now. Um, there are weekly, weekly uh, lectures that you can get access to, um, but a lot of it is community-driven, um, project-based learning that they're trying to create within this community. Um, so just to kind of, this is, a, this is not an actual real numerical graph, but uh, just to give you some sense of what's going on here. Um, so if these are, the, these, these are uh, the locus of activity goals, structure, and activity, um, which I described as my four aspects for each of these different environments here. So we have connectivist MOOCs here, which are very loosely structured, which are way out here on the outer ends. And um, we have the typical X MOOCs here in the middle, um, much more structured, having much more, uh, much more goals, much more centralized locus. Uh, a limited, more limited range of activities. Um, when I think about my course and Mitch's course is somewhere sort of floating around in this space here. Um, we, we do, this is us over, this is a learning creative learning over here. Um, this is my, my suite of courses over here. Uh, again, the, the specifics aren't important, but just to say that this is a large space that we could explore with lots of different uh, investigations in different dimensions, thinking about how we change the locus to be more distributed, how we change the activities to be more interesting and more diverse how we might have more or less structure. And I do think that we need to think about a lot of different kinds of courses that we can use to fill this space and learn about these different aspects here. So the four courses that we're developing, um, we'll have two that are launching in the fall of this year and two in the spring of next year. Each of them are only six weeks long. Um, they're, not, they're not traditional semester long courses. Uh, the first is design and development of educational technology, uh, design and development of games. Those will launch in the fall. Uh, we have design and development of educational games and implementation and evaluation of educational technology. Um, there's different kinds of clusters that people can take. So in fact, um, these two feed nicely into this one on, on designing educational games. Uh, but design and development of educational technology pairs well with this implementation and evaluation, sort of thinking of them as a, uh, an intro to ed, uh, ed tech course um, together. Uh, each one of them has a project, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, as well as video. Um, there's community aspects and engagement. <coughs> Uh, and each one of these aspects, we've thought about a particular um, pedagogical goal that we're trying here. So, so for video, we think about situated video. So it's video always in some context. Um, we're not, we don't have typically lectures. The games course has a little bit of lectures in front of a room, um, but the rest have no lectures in front of a room. Um, it's, uh, it's interview style, it's documentary style video set in real context with real people um, around the community. We also want to show that the community um, is the place where knowledge exists, not in a single person's head. Um, so it's not all me um, delivering content. I happen to be one of the three hosts that we have for the course or courses, um, but even I'm sort of just a host within this and I'm sort of helping um, to, to interview people and uh, help, um, help people share their knowledge from the community. Each one is project-based, so that's the kind of our metric for completing the course, is if you complete the project, that's the thing that you can show to somebody else to say, here, I did something that's valuable, I have a project that I can show to you. That's what we want to sort of have as the, as the, the indication of completion. 
Uh, we're trying really hard to develop community around these. This is one of the hardest things in these courses is to develop community and to have the community support each other. Um, and ultimately leave with uh, work that's personally meaningful and make the experience personally meaningful for them. So starting with video, um, I, it's, I, was, I, I gave a, a, a mock version of this talk to my lab uh, and I, I showed the next slide, which is some of the video that we have from our course. And they said, you should really show that with respect to some video that exists already in some of the edX courses and you should pull that in, into, your, uh, into your talk. And I went to go do that and I realized I actually don't need a moving video to do that. I can do that with a still screen because this is a, this is a video um, that's in one of the edX courses. And the only thing you'll see for about five minutes is this guy's head here and this same exact outline here. You'll hear some audio, uh, but nothing on the screen will move unless you look really, really closely. Um, <laughs> And that's, and that's fairly typical of what, what people are doing in videos. Now there are some people, if you look around, there are some people starting to do some more interesting things with video other than this. And this is actually, this is a, it's not that this is a bad course. Um, this, is actually, this is actually one of the, the better courses at MIT. It's a, it's a course a lot of people are interested in. Um, but it's really not taking advantage of anything that's going on in this medium here. Um, and it's really, we might think about it where it sits in the, in the educational sphere of, of utility. It might be something that might be more as a supplemental um, activity. It's, it's something that's more like a textbook than anything else. It's not really a learning environment as I would think about it. Um, you do actually get the, the blackboard. There's no more blackboard. You have tablet drawing instead, um, which is that's, that's the one time you'll see things move is you'll see things appear on a tablet as they're written. Um, so what we're trying to show in our videos is that learning is situated so that people sort of learn within particular environments that have particular affordances. Um, knowledge is community driven. Again, the fact that we're not just looking at one person's knowledge and how they share that. People come and go within various parts of the courses. Um, and the experts apply knowledge in dynamic ways. We want to talk about how teams work together and how that uh, uh, knowledge is applied and not just acquired. So when I, I'm, I'm going to show this video, but uh, the, we've actually taken all the, the dialogue out because I'm going to talk over it to talk about some of the design aspects for the video. And hopefully this works. There is music at the beginning. I'll let you hear the music. So the one important thing that you just saw there was that there's lots of different aspects, lots of different uh, components. We have comparative media studies, we have my lab, the education arcade, we have lots of different communities contributing to this. Um, we're trying to show, this is from the education intro to game design. Um, we do have some things that we try to share with people's particular facts we think are interesting, but everything's always sort of situated within a particular place. Um, this is Filament Games in Madison, Wisconsin. It's an important aspect for one of our educational games courses. Um, we do some interviews, but we also sort of go out into the community that see their process of development, all the different people who are involved, what their roles are, how they work together, um, uh, what, what people different do in this environment, how they work as a, as a team. But we're, we exist in lots of different places. This is a more academic place, Games Learning and Society, also in Madison. Um, we talk about some of the prototypes that they develop, how they develop those prototypes, how they work with those prototypes, the process of developing those, because those are processes we want to help people learn. And we don't want to sort of convey this as the process for developing prototypes. We talk about similar kinds of experiences in other different locations. So people can learn not just what is the right way to do prototypes, but what are some range of ways of doing prototypes and how do you work those. And we try to be a little bit creative with the video here. Um, and this is me giving introductions to each week. Um, so I, that's, the, that's the closest thing I do to a lecture is to give an inter introduction and overview of that. Um, we do have more familiar faces um, for some of you in the education community. Try to keep it light. Um, uh, but not, not too heavily scripted. Uh, and, uh, and again, trying to set context for people in different locations to talk about how learning happens and how development happens in different locations. Um, you'll see here on the side there was just to show you that that was Scott, who's another one of our, our hosts. So we do have several hosts that are inter doing the interviews and, uh, and helping develop the course, not just me. So that's our video. Um, I said projects are another important part. Each of these has a, has a, a project that's associated with it uh, for design and development of educational technology. Each person needs to create a Kickstarter style pitch um, for an educational technology. So they don't necessarily need to get it developed, but they need to have the, an idea developed well enough to have something that was like a Kickstarter pitch for it. Uh, for this, for design and development of games, it's developing a, a non-digital game and then a digital game using online tools that we provide for them. We're not assuming any programming knowledge coming into these courses. Uh, design development of educational games is to create either a digital game or curriculum for an existing game. In that case, uh, everybody does some of both of those, 
Um, but everybody sort of then specializes as they go down the line and create their final project. You could create either curriculum around an existing game or uh, create a, a game yourself. And finally, uh, for implementation and evaluation of educational technology, it's about uh, creating a plan for implementing a new educational technology in your classes or in, in some environment that you've defined. Uh, and for each of these, this is for one of the particular classes, um, but we do have more sort of traditional assignments. The traditional assignments are peer assessed. Um, uh, so here's just some general description of them. Compare and contrast technologies new and old. Apply a theoretical lens to some experience that you've had. Uh, modify an existing educational technology. Examine a problem in context. Um, all along, you're, getting pr you're helping to develop your project right from the start. So you do start on your project right away. Um, each of these, the uh, sort of peer assessment, our goal is to get people, and I'll talk about this in a minute, um, to get them good feedback. Um, really, basically, you either complete the assignment or you don't. Um, there's no grades associated with those. Um, but you do hopefully get feedback along the way. Um, each of these, you also get feedback along the way. But this is community-oriented feedback, uh, either in the community at large or within a group that you've helped define. Um, and in the end, you focus on your project uh, itself, as shown there. Uh, so for two of the project, for two of the courses, design development of games and design development of educational games, we've actually uh, developed an online uh, tool for creating uh, games. So we're not assuming anybody has any uh, experience coming in. Um, it was actually we. This was not a, a goal at the onset of these courses. We thought that we just kind of would find a tool that could fit this need. That people could develop games online themselves. Um, but we didn't have something that fulfilled all of our criteria of having a really low floor for, for creating them, to have it be really game specific so that people could do things like level design really easily um, and, uh, and have it be all within a web browser. Um, so this is our environment here. We borrow something, for, if any of you know environments like this, we're borrowing from uh, a platform called Melon, but we're sort of creating an online version of that with a blocks-based programming language. We want it to be very personal so people can import their own assets, um, be able to uh, personalize the games uh, as they do in a lot of other uh, learning environments like Scratch and uh, in our star logo. Uh, it's a blocks-based programming language, again, trying to keep the, the, the level of entry pretty low, uh, trying to create much more uh, game-like uh, blocks that we can have in here, things like physics, uh, things like um, different kinds of components that you can include that allow you to do game-like uh, structures really easily. Uh, and be able to share things, obviously, that's a really important aspect. So we want people to be able to share within this community and then hopefully be able to share with a larger community after they're done with their games. So as I said here, there's, there's two kinds of uh, feedback that we look for, peer assessment and community feedback. Um, and both of those are sort of pretty weak in existing MOOCs. Uh, so we're looking at ways that we can improve both of those. Uh, so this is, a, this is some of the existing, uh, this is actually the existing uh, open response that you can do within the edX platform. Uh, you can see here that you can have self-assessments, uh, uh, AI-graded assessments, and peer assessments. And the way that it's a very odd structure right now, you actually have to go through all of those. And the goal of that, it sounds a little bit weird that you have to go through self-assessment, AI assessment, and peer assessment. Um, but the goal here is to create things that are, um, that are uh, correctly graded. That's their goal. Their goal is to be able to give you a score and to have sort of value in that score, to tell you that that score is correct. Um, so you do get rubrics on here um, for different amount of point values for different things. Um, there is uh, written feedback uh, for students that you can give, which is unfortunately optional um, by default, um, which is where I think the really valuable learning comes from, not from necessarily having these um, numbers that are up here, but from potentially from written feedback. People have done some research on some of these uh, uh, peer response systems, uh, and uh, the results are pretty encouraging um, that you can actually get some reasonable results for if you train people um, to give peer-graded responses. Uh, this is one of the original studies here. and There's something like you get 64% agreement. Uh, this is some of the feedback from students, at least, in terms of how they like uh, self-assessment and peer assessment. Uh, and actually, when courses that use it and value it, the students actually start to, to think that it's actually valuable to them as well. Um, but again, these are really focused on with the goal being, um, oh, sorry, blew that up. The goal here is, again, thinking about ways that you can get people to get the right grade. There's an idea that there's a correct grade for someone's paper or someone's problem, and you want to be able to use the community to be able to get the right grade for that. Um, oops. Uh, there's a famous uh, essay that was published last year called Peer Grading Can't Work, 
uh, basically describing why in these communities that peer grading is not a possible solution, despite some of the evidence that shows that peer grading actually was enjoyed by people and valued by people and, and can actually get things that are reasonably accurate. Um, so people have been working on sort of aspects that they think are really important for how you actually get peer grading to work, because it's not, it's not that it necessarily works in all cases, uh, but you need to think about what the criteria are. So this is Debbie Morrison who's written a lot about, uh, uh, blogged a lot about um, the way that we develop uh, some of these courses. Uh, and these are her set of criteria for these things. Um, so people should be at similar skill levels. Um, there should be low stakes. Um, you can't grant credit. Uh, people need to be mature and self-directed. Uh, they need to navigate within a network setting to know how to work within these environments. And they need to have a set of communication skills. Uh, someone here at Penn, um, maybe you guys know him, Ben Wiggins, uh, developed a set of other criteria for his own particular course uh, uh, that he wrote in response to that peer grading can't work. Um, where these are the things that he asks his students to do, identify the argument, identify the evidence, what makes the person's uh, essay persuasive, how can it be stronger, provide some feedback, um, and rate simply as unsatisfactory, satisfactory, or accomplished. I think that's actually a really good way of thinking about it, that you basically either didn't do it, you did do it, or you did it really well. And that's kind of a nice rubric for, uh, that I think gets people thinking about those different aspects, because you do want people's feedback to be structured um, if you just ask people to give open-ended feedback, they probably won't give very valuable feedback. If you ask them to sort of structure their responses and rate some things, at least in some way, then the responses that they then give in a written feedback can then be structured around those same things. Um, so one of the things that uh, I told you that I'm, we're not grading in my course, but by default, when you create a course in edX, this is what grading looks like. Zero to 60 is failure. You probably have seen many sort of grading schemes like this. Um, and in my mind, this is really a problematic about the way we think about grading within these environments, the way we think about earning credit. Fortunately, you can change this so that um, you can make pass, fail, and basically, basically if you did anything at all, you can pass the course, and if you don't do anything at all, you can fail the course. Um, and this is more or less like the way we see our course being created, um, where really participation is the important part, and really having that final project is your, is your key to, to showing that you've actually done anything valuable in the course. Um, so that gets to um, thinking about how we, uh, uh, how we think about peer assessment within ours. Uh, so we want to focus on feedback and learning and not grades. So we want people to be able to provide valuable feedback to each other. Um, that's going to require some structure and training around useful feedback. And other people have shown that that's, that, that can work. Uh, we want to promote value of feedback. So we want to be able to think about how we communicate that to the community itself. Uh, it's still a bit of a question to us. Has, that we don't want to actually grade their grading. Um, but we want to show them that that's valuable. Um, we're thinking about, I was talking to Susan earlier about badging systems. We currently don't have any badging systems associated with this. I have mixed feelings about badges. Um, but there might be some ways that we think about giving people sort of credit um, and specialization and maybe giving people good feedback as one of those. Uh, and really thinking about ways can, we can actually structure feedback in smaller groups. So not that you're just getting random things that are good to everybody, but are there ways that we can think about structuring feedback in smaller groups. Um, so discussion forums have been uh, a particularly problematic for, um, for MOOCs. Uh, this is the, the forums that we have in edX, um, and the ones in Coursera are not too, too uh, dissimilar from this. You can see here, this is uh, all discussions. This one has 150 votes, I think, and 264 comments. Uh, and these happen typically very fast. Um, you get people uh, commenting on these things very quickly. And so actually following these and participating in them, it can be really challenging for, for, for people. Um, and so what happens here, this is a, a study of a bunch of the forums in a bunch of the initial Coursera courses. The blue bars here, do I pull this up? Yeah, the blue, bar, the blue bars here are people who had uh, more than one post. The red bar are people who had only one post. And the rest of the percentages are people who had no posts at all. Um, and you can see here something like the average is something like 10 or 20 percent of people actually do any posting. Um, and uh, there's this one bar way out here. Um, where like 90% uh, of the people posted, and I, that's a friend of mine who, who ran that course. And I asked him what he did in his course to do that, and he said, well, I, I required it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he also showed value around it. So that was part of your grade was your participation, and you had to have a certain number of things that you did. And he actually um, made sure that it wasn't just about like I, I posted, but there had to be sort of uh, qualifications for what you did in, the, in that posting. I mean, he thought that the, that the feedback that the people got there was pretty valuable. But for the most part, people here are reading, they're not writing. Um, I did talk to that guy. Uh, but if we look at other places where communities exist, um, it's just the volume of things doesn't necessarily, shouldn't necessarily slow the community down. Uh, so this is, a, this is a subreddit on education. Um, for those of you that know Reddit, it's a very active online community. 
um, and people um, people do uh, sort of contribute to those communities really uh, uh, in, in a lot of ways. Um, you look at the forums like I already mentioned, the elitist jerks. Um, there's some of these topics here. This one I think has uh, 387,000 replies. I um, mean, people still come back to these forums. So there's ways that people sort of uh, subgroup within these communities, the way that people think about the frequency at which they post and read, where people are making sense of some of this data in large numbers. Um, so we're thinking about these different designs, and I won't go into too many details on these things, um, but we're thinking about things like um, uh, how you have people vote so that people can, things can rise up to the top where people are finding it more valuable. Um, you can see those votes here. Um, tags, uh, different organizational techniques that people use. Um, so typically people uh, just post things in these threads and then trying to find the thing that I want in that thread either means doing an open-ended search or trying to sort of move through these different lines. Um, tags are something that people find really valuable if people can use them well. Um, uh, it's also sort of developing a personal identity within each of these environments. That's something that's been really absent from Coursera and from, uh, and from edX, is developing any sort of sense of who you are within this and be able to share that identity with other people. Um, so these are some of the things that you get to do here. You can have your friends and your messages all sort of correlated here. Um, you can have your own activity. People can see your activity. You can develop a reputation within that community. And I think that's really important for how, how communities ultimately develop is sort of de having people sort of have some investment in their own identity within that community and having other people have access to pieces of that identity. Uh, the other thing we're doing is using um, uh, things like stack, uh, ideas from Stack Overflow. For those of you who are in the technical community, you probably know Stack Overflow. It's a really popular community for people asking technical questions and getting answers to those technical questions. Uh, people do ask questions. You can get answers. Um, you can look at how many people view those answers. Um, uh, and then people can vote on those answers and decide which ones are correct. And then other people can go back and then look at those answers that were correct and which were voted as correct. Um, so this is our version of that that we're integrating into our course where people can ask questions, uh, have answers, vote on answers, et, et cetera. Um, and we separate this from the discussion forums. The discussion forums are really for helping people generate ideas, um, review, review each other's work. If you really have a question that needs an answer, it can go in here in a much more structured way. Um, so this gets to, to CSCL, and thanks again. <laughs> um, so CSCL stresses collaboration among the students. Um, it's not simply reacting to posts in isolation. And the learning takes place through interactions among students, um, and students learn by expressing their questions, pursuing lines of inquiry together, teaching each other, and seeing how each other learn. Um, so we're really trying to think about ways that we can create that within this community as well. Um, and I think that's... Uh, that's uh, our idea here is to sort of help create smaller communities. It's really hard to think about how you have that happen in a group of you know, 500, 5,000, or 50,000 people. Um, so this isn't our first, the first quest into having groups work together in MOOCs. Uh, this is one that happened last year. Um, and this is the headline that followed that, which was online classes on how to teach online classes goes laugh laughably awry. Um, so we don't want that to happen in our classes. Um, this was a course, I think it was at uh, Georgia Tech, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and the idea was it was a course about um, MOOCs. Uh, and the, the punchline here was um, that uh, they tried to have people work together in groups. And what you did was fill in your information in a big Google spreadsheet. And then you could use the Google spreadsheet to find other people who were like you. Um, but they didn't realize that Google spreadsheets have a limit of 50 simultaneous editors. Uh, and so after 50 people were trying to use this at once, everybody sort of got that they couldn't access it, and everybody got really frustrated, and everybody left the course, and they shut the course down before it completed. It's affordable healthcare. What'd you say? It's, it's like affordable healthcare. <laughs> <laughs> um, except this has been shut down. Um, so, uh, so that's, uh, so that's uh, 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 an example I think we don't want to repeat in our, own, um, in our own work. Some of that is sort of limits of technical tools, um, and it's really hard to think about how you then test things at scale. Um, so maybe they tested this with, you know, 48 people, um, which seems like a big number in typical groups, but that wouldn't have uh, helped you run into this, um, answer this particular question about what was going on here. Um, so, but you can also see other places where groups exist. This is Facebook groups. People do sort of create these groups that exist with, you know, uh, dozens, hundreds, sometimes thousands of people working together on different uh, issues or just sharing ideas with each other. So we want to think about how we can inherit some of the ideas from these groups, which are um, at least effective in some cases. Uh, so this is our groups. Uh, so you can create a group in, in, our, in our world. It has different components, forums, documents that you can have, members. You can send invites to other people. You can share media with each other. Um, do I have it on the next page? No, I'm not on the next page. Um, 
Uh, but you can actually create groups that are either open, um, that allow other people to just join and have those groups be as large as you want. You can create private groups where you can have groups that are just a, a smaller number of people. You can close groups if they get too large. Uh, so we really want to have the groups be a little bit more organic and people can exist in multiple groups. So you might have a group of teachers if you're coming in as a teacher and want to be able to communicate with those people. But you might also have a project group where you're working with just three or four or five other people um, and you might make that group private and be able to share things only with them. Each of those groups have different kinds of tools that they can use to share things. Um, so, so where we sort of see this going um, uh, in the future, we have a couple different things that we're, we're exploring. Uh, so one of these is um, two of these courses are being combined uh, into uh, an introductory course that we're creating for a, uh, a master's degree program that we're trying to create at MIT in learning sciences and technology. And those two courses will be combined and offered online with face-to-face -face components as well, or, or, or synchronous components rather. So students will actually be taking these courses from afar, but there'll be uh, MOOC components as well as uh, synchronous components with each other and with people who are, are, are physically in a classroom with us. Um, I do want to say that um, educators can learn. I talked about sort of the, the, the kind of flow in different directions. Um, so this is, um, this is, I think, the, the most recent version of Knowledge Form. Um, and you can see here that um, while Knowledge Form sort of has a really uh, interesting pedagogy that underlies it, it's technology. Um, certainly now is, is a little bit dated, but even at the time, sort of we can look at sort of good examples of HCI um, and see some of those are not present here. Um, there's one, two, three, four windows open at the same time with a menu that's really long. So navigating the space just from an HCI perspective is really complicated. Um, so we need to think about ways that sort of people work together to sort of help develop technologies that are more effective for people. Um, so that means informing those things with good um, pedagogy, but also means informing them with good design. Um, so that's part of one of our goals. Um, we're creating a platform which um, exists now, um, but will be launched publicly, I think, next week, um, called Education Express. Um, it's an online platform for, uh, uh, about digital learning. Uh, it has a number of different components here, collections, news, reading lists, et cetera. Um, but our idea for this community is to create a place where we can rapidly distribute um, information and publications around digital learning. That could mean things that are hybrid face-to-face -face learning, um, it could mean things that are totally online, um, but it means that we get things into the in, that are published faster. Because right now we're in a field that's moving really quickly, and we don't have a lot of platforms for, for sharing of those ideas. Specifically, we're interested in ideas where we kind of get those two different communities together, where we're getting the educators um, that have a, a, a rich knowledge, and we're getting the people from engineering who have a different set of rich knowledge, and we're getting them to be able to communicate with each other. Um, so part of that, we have uh, a reading list. It sounds a little bit trivial, but as people try to jump into this space, and I've talked with many engineers uh, in the last couple of years who are trying to get into this space, who are really interested in doing things effectively within this space, but they don't necessarily know where to begin. Um, so we we're trying to create a, a sort of a reading list that's, that's captain size. We don't want this to be infinitely large. Captain size that's the most useful resources for getting people familiar with some of the research that's going on in this area. Um, so one of the things we, we actually host here is uh, this is some of the data that came out. Some of you may have seen this, but Harvard and MIT published uh, a bunch of data from uh, some of their courses, trying to give people snapshots of what's going on inside these MOOC courses. So there was, uh, I think, uh, something like uh, 12 courses or something like that that were published there um, with data about those courses. In it, and we're hosting some of that data there now. Um, but one of the things we've learned from this is that um, although we've changed sort of, we, I, I've talked about the change or lack of change on this side of the classroom, I'm going to get back to the lack of change we've seen on this side of the classroom. So again, it's the same people who are taking these courses, whether it's online or face-to-face. -face, we're not really sort of changing who's taking courses. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, Justin Reich, who's a, who writes a blog for, for Education Week, who, um, who wrote a, a, a post a couple weeks ago, Big Data MOOC Research Breakthrough, Learning Activities Lead to Achievement. Um, so you actually have to, his hypothesis here, or his statement here, is that the research has shown us surprisingly that people who are actively engaged in learning learn more, um, which is a, a surprise to a lot of people who are in big data who didn't necessarily know those things. But it's not a surprise to a lot of people who have been in this for a long time. Um, and his ultimate, his, uh, he calls Reich's Law of Doing Stuff, uh, which I'll let you read here, but it's a, basically you have to do stuff to learn. If you just sit and watch stuff, you're not necessarily really going to learn very much. Um, and that's really what's, what's going on here. So again, we haven't changed that front of the classroom, but what that's leading to is a lack of change on the other side of the classroom here. We're not having that more diverse audience. 
We're not having uh, a more global audience that's really participating in, in deep ways. We're really not changing uh, the, the sort of understanding we have about the way we can learn online. So this is the hype cycle that people have talked about uh, with many technologies, um, but it has come up recently with, uh, with, the, with MOOCs as well because we clearly so I think we went up this peak. I hope we're not still on this peak. I think we've gone up this peak here of inflated expectations. Uh, we've kind of fallen down. I think there's been a lot of criticism in the last year uh, of a lot of the MOOCs designs into that trough of disillusionment. And I think we're sort of back on our way up here where we're hopefully going to get to a place where we can actually pr be productive with these environments. So with that, I'll say thanks to all the organizations who have helped support us. And thanks for having me here today. Yes. Um, your project for you know, the four courses. What what's the average for each in terms of the production costs? Uh, so uh, I, I I'm going to question whether I should pull one piece out or not. So the game development tool eats up a lot of that budget in and of itself. So I'm going to pull that aside for a second and say if we didn't have the game development tool as part of our budget, our budget is. Um, about a hundred thousand dollars a course. And that, <laughs> um, that includes that includes other additional new technology development. So we are um, the whole the platform that I mentioned that we're that we're trying to get forums going on that uses um, uh, WordPress as its basis, but we're doing a lot of modification of that. Um, so hopefully, if I if I did my next four courses. That might be another way of thinking about it. If I did my next four courses, what would I need to budget for my next four courses now that that technology is developed? I would still guess um, from scratch, uh, it may be half that, maybe fifty thousand dollars a course. But I don't think I don't think a lot less than that. Um, uh, still more than we get it. Our our video production is more expensive than than putting somebody at the front of the room. Having one person at the front of the room giving lectures is a relatively cheap way to do to video. Um, to get that sort of sense of a community and be able to do it, go and do that, definitely has resources for camera people going out into the field and recording that, figuring out ways you edit that together that's not scripted. Um, so thinking about the editing process that goes into that um, is fairly intensive. So I don't think it's, um, at least using our styles, we'd probably get half that, but, but uh, I think getting a lot less than that would be, um, would be a challenge. Yep. So I, I'm no techie, but I was attracted to MOOCs from the beginning because of the opportunity for democratization of education. And you've said several times, and we know from studies here at Penn, University of Michigan, your own studies, that we're reaching the same people. We're not reaching a diverse yep. audience. It seems to me you have an assumption here about that if we improve the pedagogy and the way you're doing it makes a lot of sense, that somehow we'll overcome that. But I wonder what kind of research is being done on the attritters? and on people who don't show up in the first place. It seems to me we have a the, lot to learn from that. The, I noticed, I just say one more thing? Yeah, I noticed sure. in one of your early slides that when you show just 6% have a complete, 6.4% of a completion of a certificate, that Spain stood out there. Spain, there are a lot of people in Spain who got that certificate compared to others. So what are we learning from Sp the Spanish? Sure, so uh, I'll, give my, I'll give my Spanish hypothesis last. Okay. Um, I think you're really right about what it, we, we learned very little from, it's very hard to know about the people who don't show up at all, and we're not learning enough about the people who leave the courses. Um, I was talking to Susan earlier today, uh, Mark Gustile, who I know gave a talk earlier in this, in this series, had a blog post this morning pointing to a Financial Times article about big data. And it's exactly about, his point is exactly about that. We're not, and, and someone then there as well, is we're, we're not learning about the stuff we don't know anything about. We're getting these very selected samples that we can learn things from. So it's really hard to learn things about the people who don't show up at all. Um, we're starting to get some things in terms of like exit interviews from people who were in the course and either didn't participate or left for, or actively left for some reason. Those people we can start to learn something from. Um, uh, the, the challenge of learning from the people who don't even show up, I think, is, um, is one that I don't know how to solve, um, but is a really important one to, to be able to face. To, to, I mean, we might be able to look at how we might, if we, if, we, if we are successful in attracting a larger audience, we might be able to sort of help understand why those people weren't attracted to other courses, maybe doing some things like that. Um, but it's a really important and challenging question to answer. Um, so my hypothesis about Spain um, is that Spain has a well-educated, um, but vastly underemployed workforce right now. 
Um, <laughs> so it's, those are great criteria for people taking courses. <laughs> um, so they have the education they need in order to be able to get into these courses, and they have the time that they need to be able to take these courses, and also a motivation for trying to advance their technical skills even further. A lot of these are MITx courses, a lot of technical courses there. So thinking about how that might help you get a leg up um, uh, is a way, is, a, is I think why, why we're seeing a lot of people from there um, taking those courses. Yep. Um, I was very you know, impressed about kind of thinking of enhancing the social component discussion forums. And you showed some examples from other communities, gaming communities, uh, other online communities where people kind of participate. But lo and behold, most of the studies have shown in these massive online communities that you know, it's 5% of the people who yep. generate 95% yep. of the content. So how do you change, I think you can kind of change, I mean, I don't know how you want to describe this relationship, but it's kind of been true across all different types of, maybe there's something about the size, if you have 20,000 people, that yeah. this doesn't lend itself. So, and there is, there's, there were two, two different studies that were published in terms of size of course and rate of participation. One showed no correlation, one showed a negative correlation. So the larger the course, the smaller percentage of people who are that participated. Um, but so I think, I think it gets back to trying to create effective groups. Um, so people, when you're, when you're one voice within 20,000 or 50,000, it's really hard to think about how your voice makes a difference. Um, there's also another study about the super posters. I don't know if you've seen this one, but the people who post like 50 or more times within a course, and they make up sort of a large volume of the posts within there. So even, even if when you look at late rates of participation, that may not be telling the full story. Um, but I think being able to work effectively within those groups and figure out how to create those um, will be really important because it means your voice is one among a few as, a, as opposed to one among many. But it's still a question of how you create those groups. Um, uh, we're either going to let those groups form organically. Um, there, we have two other tools that we're exploring as well to help people sort of create those groups themselves. Google spreadsheets are not one of them. Um, but that idea of the Google spreadsheet was the right idea, I think. The technical details were wrong. Um, but the idea of, of helping people sort of, um, you know, it happens in, uh, in, in lots of online services when you look at dating services are doing it effectively, matching people up. Um, and there are, I know there's uh, some work, I think, at Georgia Tech around, around uh, matching people within groups. Um, so there are ways that we can think about to improve that matching and getting people to work more effectively in those groups. And that may be not unlike dating or, or maybe even like dating where you're trying to find people sometimes with complementary skills and sometimes with... Um, with, with similar skills. Yep. So how do, you, how do you decide whether a course is a MOOC? Is it, does it have the potential to reach a massive number or it actually reaches a massive How do you, what's the, <laughs> I, I don't quite get the definition yet. So the, the definition is I think they, they can scale somewhat independently of the personnel behind the course. Um, so, and that's not completely independently because some of these courses, a lot of the better ones, do employ some TAs yeah. to be able to look through the forums and try to rate things up and answer some of the questions. So it doesn't scale totally independently of the number of people that are in the course, but it scales somewhat independently <laughs> of the number of people. There's a loose correlation between size of, size of course and, uh, and personnel that are behind the course. Um, that's why one of the ones that have been totally automated where uh, you know, maybe there's some people answering some questions in the forum, but they're mostly auto-graded, everything. Um, those really fit that definition. I think as you start getting into some of that more personnel involved, you know, it's um, uh, what, what, how that scaling works is still, I think, somewhat of a question. But it, it does at least scale somewhat independently of the number of people in the course. Yep. What are your next thoughts on gadgets? <laughs> um, so that's a different talk. But uh, um, so I think, I think, uh, I remember reading a, a few years ago, um, uh, Rich Halverson and Alan Collins' book uh, about educational technology. I, I can't remember if they used the word badges, but they used this idea of certification in sort of like this more granular level. Um, and I was, really, I was really excited about that idea because I think we think about, particularly at the secondary school level now, we have this certification. Basically, it's a, at the degree level. You got your high school degree or you didn't. Um, uh, and I think there'd be a lot of benefit for kids themselves seeing some of that more sort of achievement at sort of more smaller scale and actually having a more diverse set of things that they could go and, and, and seek their achievements in. Um, but what that ultimately has come to mean, I think, in most of the online learning environments um, and even within in the space of learning are these sort of really, really micro level achievements. 
Um, so instead of like we were talking about things earlier, like you know that I've learned uh, I've learned HTML and I've made a web page, or I've learned t-tests and we're able to apply those in some context. It's more like I logged into the website three times, um, or um, you know I I clicked on five pages. Um, I, I, I when I do give a talk on this, I have a, a slide that I took from there was an article in the New York Times I think about a year or a year and a half or so ago about about badges and gamification, um, and in that article, like, you got badges. And one of them was, I got the Scroll King Award for scrolling to the bottom of the page. <laughs> and this, I think it's really, um, not, only is it, not only is it not productive, I think it's counterproductive, um, because it's not teaching people any kind of long-term goals. It's not teaching them any kind of mo uh, metacognition around their own learning. There's a lot of things that we're really being deprived of for this sort of behavior training of, I do something and I get an immediate reward. And we know what happens in the long run with those. So I think if we can push things more towards the idea of we're going to give badges for some sort of significant, somewhat larger accomplishment that's smaller than a course, uh, I think that's, that has a lot of value. And I'd like to see something in that. And I do think that having the idea that I can be specialized even within a course is a really valuable thing. As I mentioned, you know, maybe it's, it's people that really like to give a lot of feedback. That's a really valuable thing. And I'd like to give some recognition for that. Maybe it's people who, um, who, who figure out how to get groups to work together. Maybe it's people who, um, do really great jobs on their assignments and then maybe don't even, maybe they don't do the project. Maybe it's people who do great jobs on the project. I'd like to be able to recognize each of those people in a significant way for the course. I don't, uh, how, how that happens is, is a bit of a question. There are systems for doing that somewhat automatically based on what happens inside the system and I'm not sure those are so great yet. Um, but being able to think about ways that we can foster some of that is a really good thing, but I really wanna, it gets really muddied with this idea of these really sort of micro level or nano level achievements which I think are, are really wasteful. Yep. Can you tell a little bit about how you're going to assess your, your the, the success of your courses? Yeah, so it's, it, is, it is a challenge. I think, so I, I talked about different criteria in terms of um, participations. We want to see about, we're looking at the, the sort of fall off curve of people in terms of participation, trying to keep that, um, you know, it's, it's typically a very rapid uh, fall off curve where we get down to about 10% in a few weeks. Uh, so, so that's one metric. Um, the, who the audience is is, a, is another metric, seeing how we compare to people who are taking other edX courses, trying to both geographically, uh, in terms of education, in terms of all these other aspects, to see whether we can attract a more diverse audience. Um, and, then, and then through interviews, trying to interview people who, who have taken the course and maybe who are for people who are, have, have either registered or not completed the course, being able to interview them and trying to figure out why they've completed the course, why they haven't completed the course, what aspects of it they find valuable. Yeah. You mentioned a little bit about what you're assessing the course. So these four courses that you're, what, two you're launching this year and two next year, what are you doing to sort of circumvent some of the issues you, that you spoke about that are the, the faults with X MOOCs? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, it's these different, it's the videos, it's the projects, it's the, it's the social tools, and it's being able to communicate to our audience about the value of those things. Um, so so we, wanna, we really want to be upfront about what the course is. Um, what's going to be the expectations that are in those and why you should take it. And that means th there's two sides to that. One is we, if, if you're someone who just is planning on coming in and just watching some things and learning something, it's probably not the course for you. And we should probably message people about that. But for other people who have been turned off by, the, by other courses where it's just about sort of doing problem sets and learning from videos, we want to be able to find those people and be able to get a message to them. So we're going to have to do some of our own PR that's not through the edX machine um, where we can actually hopefully get the word out to those people. And some of that will be um, uh, through teacher networks because some of the courses we imagine will be, so the, the, the games course and the educational games course, we imagine we'll get people at the secondary school level, kids, as well as teachers who are interested in those things. Uh, uh, some uh, business networks, we think that people are interested who, um, uh, who are interested in educational technology. There's a huge industry now in educational technology startups that we'd really like to reach because most of those people are coming from engineering backgrounds and not from education backgrounds. Um, so there, those, those are other communities we want to make sure we can reach. Yep? Um, did you think of integrating in your uh, newly designed platform social networks, like you put, allow people to log in with their Facebook accounts or LinkedIn accounts so they can find their friends who they can relate to throughout their learning journey and helps them to persist in the... That's, that's a good question and it's, it's, it's problematic right now. Um, uh, so right now you have to log in with your edX credentials and that's how you get into ours. There's just, ours is just a, we'll have an edX entryway where we host all of our static content like our videos 
Um, and then that will get you into that same login will get you into our other site where we have all our community aspects. We can allow people into that other community with their LinkedIn or their Google or their Facebook accounts. Um, we can also let them post out from the course into, into those places, even if it's a different uh, login. Um, and we're just, we're, we have to have some discussions with edX around how they feel about those things. <laughs> And there's advantages and disadvantages to that. We already know that people are creating Facebook groups based around most of the popular MOOC courses. And so they are sort of doing this integration, but it means having to find those people outside of that network again, which seems like an unnecessary step. Um, so I think it's, something, it's a place where we want to explore. I'm not sure what we'll do in this first iteration. Um, I'm guessing we won't allow logins, but we may allow some of that linking out. So if you, wanna, if you have something you want to share through your social network, you'll be able to do that. Great, Thank thanks. You.